All right, guys, I uh, just got back from my Transamerica trail ride and thought I'd do a quick video of uh, what I took and all the gear I carried. And then uh, once I finish go through my gear and my bags, my tank bag and stuff, I will cover uh, bike prep, what I did for my bike to get it ready to go. I'll talk about uh, whatever kind of spare parts I might have carried and then also i will finish up by going over uh kind of what i learned on the trip what i experienced uh stuff like that so that way you can kind of scroll through the video and see what parts uh interest you or whatever and you don't have to watch all of it if you don't want to so uh just real quick on the front of the bike let's see this is a uh dirtbikegear.com this is a front uh, fender tube bag so in here i have just a standard 21 inch front tube uh let's see then i have a giant loop zigzag bag in here i have multiple charging cables for anything that i needed to charge on the bike during the ride uh, i took two of each probably because when you're riding in the rain these charging cables if they tend to get wet uh, they have a tendency to quit charging until they dry out good. So this is all just charging cables or multiples of charging cables. Uh, two wall adapters in case I get a motel room or someplace and need to charge uh, or at like a restaurant during lunch. I need to charge multiple things quickly. Had two of those. Uh, these things are worth their weight in gold if you're riding all day, every day. Uh, the first day I didn't wear them. The second day I put them in and I wore them every single day after that. So I kept those handy there. This is just a, like a sandwich bag that I had rigged up <clears throat> to go over my charging port here. If it did rain, I could put that over real quick and keep that charging. But it was nice to have the, if you're charging your phone the whole time or your GPS, if I, the few times I did hit rain, I would just unplug it. <clears throat> and if I needed to plug it back in, if the rain lasted too long, then I could with that little setup. And then uh, there's my insurance card and uh, some zip ties in there. So that's pretty much all that's in that bag. Now I've got my tank bag here. It's a, a Wolfman Enduro. And I will uh, take that off and carry it over here to my makeshift table and show you what's inside there. Okay, so here's my tank bag. Uh, and it's a little front pouch. Had some extra earplugs. A couple of uh, little lace straps just in case I needed those uh some trash i kept a couple of napkins from a restaurant in there i did ride through some rain and that was handy just to grab that out pop your visor keep going now inside here uh, this is kind of i had this more organized but i just kind of crammed it in there for the ride home uh, wet wipes so if you need to wipe your hands off or wipe down at night at camp keep those handy uh, any kind of those are just vitamins, but I kept my you know any kind of medications you need to eat, you know take with food while you're eating breakfast or lunch. Keep that handy there. This is a uh, small bottle of 80-90 gear weight oil. That's my chain lube. I'll cover more of that when I cover the bike and the prep. Uh, so I kept that in here to refill my chain oiler. Uh, up here in the top is a little bit of small first aid kit with some nitrile gloves uh, just for basic stuff like that and then this is just the uh, rain fly that goes over this tank bag this was my main uh, navigation phone uh, I'm recording on my main phone this is a old iPhone 8 and I used Gaia for the whole trip it worked great so I kept this in here for when I, you know night time or whatever uh, but that's what I use my main phone for navigation. You know, you gotta blow your nose a lot. A uh, rechargeable headlamp. This uh, has a battery, built-in battery, and you can recharge it from a USB port here. So that's pretty handy for camping. A set of earbuds. Uh, I use these more at nighttime in the camp than I did actually riding. Uh, it seems like when you ride, if you're riding down a highway, when you actually need these things, it's hard to hear between the wind noise and the rear tire noise and the chain slapping and stuff like that but a pair of earbuds are nice to have this is just some uh stuff to clean my goggles my safety glasses 
uh, you will be riding through a ton of dust, either from the guy in front of you, a car you catch up to, a side-by-side -side or oncoming traffic, because out west you ride so much dirt and gravel that you're in dust all day long. So something to clean your visor or your glasses, having that accessible is nice. Uh, this is the remainder of my toilet paper and my hand sanitizer. You need to keep that handy. What I did at home before I left is I waited till my toilet paper got down to about half a roll, took it off the roll of the bathroom, ripped the cardboard piece out of the center, and then you can squish that down flat and uh, roll it up, and it doesn't take up much room. Uh, a little bit of protection just in case. This is uh, two extra batteries and a recharging block for my Insta360 camera. And then in here are my SD cards. Another iPhone with all of my maps and the route and every GPS point that I've dropped, you know, pin that I put on my route for gas, food, motels, repair shops. So this is an even older iPhone. But in case this one broke, I dropped it, I lost it, it quit charging or whatever. I wanted to have a second phone for backup that will fit on my mount. So I never even used this thing, but it's it was programmed and ready to go. And, and either one of these phones have SIM cards in them. They don't work for anything other than just navigation. Unless you turn on uh, my iPhone that I'm videoing this with has, as most of them do, you can turn on a hotspot setting on it and then turn your Wi-Fi on on this phone and then if I got somewhere I needed to go to a, uh, a motel or state park for a campground or whatever, I could turn on the hotspot on my phone, turn the Wi-Fi on this phone, and now this phone has internet capabilities if your main phone has internet reception at the time. And so you could turn this thing on Google Maps and then you could use this and have turn-by-turn uh, -turn directions to wherever you needed to go. Uh, so that, that came in handy once or twice, so that's a good option you know, you don't need to have two active phones. Uh, this one with no SIM card still works just fine on Wi-Fi. Uh, this is an Anchor battery pack, uh, 20,000 milliamp hours, I believe. Uh, I use this a few times at night to charge a few things, but uh, didn't use it near as much as I thought. Uh, these are just some uh, some more uh, lens alcohol wipes to clean your lens, your goggles, or whatever. And I threw a couple of ibuprofen packs in there. Fingernail clippers. Uh, you're on the road for a long time, so you need to keep things trimmed up. I threw some salt in there. Never needed that. That was a complete waste. Here's an Outback Motor Trek uh, Motor Tech hat that they sent me when I bought some stuff from them. I kept a hat in here just in case. Never pulled it out one time. Uh, this is a small, just an Amazon special voltmeter. And I carried some extra batteries for it. I've had issues with other people's bikes in the past on past trips. And, uh, you know, a voltmeter is something this compact would come in very handy in diagnosing a, a broken wire or a, a dead battery or something like that. Didn't need that. This is a small handheld chainsaw as you can see it's actual chainsaw chain that you fold over backwards and then two people can saw this thing back and forth or one person uh, on the east coast in Tennessee I think twice in Tennessee or maybe once in North Carolina and once in Tennessee I ran up on two different groups of riders that had turned around and I ran into them within a hundred yards of the downed tree that made them turn around and that would have forced them to backtrack, you know, 50 plus miles. And something this small and compact saved the day both times. They were, both people were very grateful and they said they were going to buy those things as soon as they got to some place of service. Uh, electrical tape, a couple of toothpicks to floss with. And I carried this little See the Summit head net. Uh, we ran into bugs and mosquitoes and flies out west, but it never was bad enough to make me want to put this thing on. So I took it for nothing, basically. So that's all in a tank bag. All right, I'm gonna try to walk around this setup real quick and show you everything before I tear it apart. So what this is, this is the Moscow Moto. This is a Reckless 40 setup. 
but this is not the eight liter stinger that comes with it. This is the 20 or 22 liter uh, tail bag off of the Reckless 80 that I also have. And so what I've done, as you can see, it's a 40. These are some insulated water bottle pouches and you can put your hydro cell, hydro flask, whatever in there. So that gives you uh, 32 ounces of water there. And then in these little pouches, I kept some liquid IV powdered uh, supplements in here. Keep me hydrated. Uh, that's also a pack of uh, filter skins, but I kept this thing full of liquid IV and then over here on the same side. So I've got 64 ounces of water there. Then tucked in here, these are 20 ounce life water bottles. And these things are a good, long, slim bottle, super tough. I kept these for the entire trip. And uh, I just refill them each night when I, when I had a gas station or whatever. So I've got uh, 32 and 32 for drink cold drinking water. And then I've got these two for extra water for cooking or emergency water. And then right here in this beaver tail is my uh, USWE 100 ounce uh, camelback and uh, I hit hot temperatures on the uh, east coast but it, I was you're in town so much you can stop and drink plenty of water but on the west coast I knew I'd be in you know remote areas and I wanted to have extra water so I'd use this on the west coast when I got really hot and we were out in the desert and stuff like that so uh, you can see here I've got uh, one flip-flop here and then one on the other side also those are my shower flip-flops and of course the uh, you know the tool bags tool bags down here on both sides I'll cover all that and then uh, here's my tent poles with my rain fly this tail bag has all my clothes and uh, then this little rear pouch here this has all of my food so let me strip us down one at a time and I'll show you what I carry and I'll start here on this uh, on the left side of the box okay here's the left pouch and there's the, uh, the flip-flop and then in this uh, leg I carried, this is a rehydrating pouch from anti-gravity gear. What this is, is uh, you can put your freeze-dried food in here and reconstitute it, let it rehydrate, and it kind of keeps it insulated. I'll cover that more when I cover the, uh, the food bag. Here's my cooking kit. So here I got a, this is a human gear. It's a spoon fork combo. I only eat rehydrated food, so I only use the spoon there. On the East Coast, I carried a smaller version of this. And then once I got on the West Coast, uh, I actually had a friend meet me halfway in Oklahoma and we finished the route. So I had seven days to get to him. So I carried a small bottle, then I dropped this off in his truck and I picked up this big bottle. And, uh, that's nowhere near empty, so that worked out great for the remainder of the trip. Simple little pot. Four ounce collapsible measuring cup. A Northern Lights small compact stove. And then I pack all that in here with paper towel. And then this thing has a piezo igniter that hasn't worked for years, so I carry a lighter. And I carry a second lighter for backup and I put a zip tie around that so that this can't get depressed and, and what's in the, you know, in here bouncing around and drain this thing down. And then this is just a military grade uh, can opener. And I've never used this thing, but I figure if, if I run out of food somewhere and I have to get something from a gas station or whatever, and I can buy canned food and use this to open it in a pinch. Well, that's all my cooking gear right there. And then down here is uh, the, my tent. It is a marmot tungsten. Tungsten one person tent. It's pretty small and it gets the job done. And I try to go small and light if I can. And that's just a rain fly for it. And the, uh, this tent does have a vestibule on one side. So at nighttime, my clothes, 
My riding gear went underneath my sleeping pad to kind of help prop my head up. I do have a pillow in here. Uh, then my helmet would go down at one side of my feet and my clothes bag would go to the other side of my foot, my feet. So it's kind of kind of tight in my tent, but it's uh, I like having a smaller pack out. So here is my Nemo tensor. Uh, it's an insulated sleeping pad. It's a long wide. I'm six foot two, so I wanted something big. I didn't want, I don't like falling off the side of my pad. And this is a uh, X-Ped uh, Mega Pillow. It's got a fleece liner. It blows up. It's super comfortable. And that made a world of difference. And that's all in that leg. All right, here's the leg off the exhaust side. Of course, I got the other flip-flop. This is a pair of small collapsible camp shoes to wear at night. Uh, these are Crocs. Uh, they see how small they fold down, compact, and I keep them in a the bag that they came with so that I don't get the rest of the stuff in here dirty. Here's a Helinox Chair 1. Uh, being able to sit on a chair in a chair at night and lean back and let my back rest a little bit was very nice at night. I don't go camping, motor camping without that. You can go super light and lay against the front tire of your bike or whatever, but that's not for me. I want a chair to sit down in. And then the only other thing in this bag is this is a REI brand Heliosac. It's a 50 degree bag. It's long. And then inside down here, the foot is a Sea to Summit polyester uh, sleeping bag liner. So I have a 30 degree mummy bag that I typically carry, but I knew since I was leaving on July 1st for this ride that I was going to spend almost all of my time in hot weather, hot temperatures at night. Uh, I knew I might be camping up high at elevation in the Rockies, and I did one night, and I actually had two nights, one in Cal uh, at Colorado at 10,000 feet. I woke up and it was 40 degrees. And so with this 50 degree bag and this liner, plus a couple of hot hands thrown down in the, in the foot, uh, I made it through the night okay. I wasn't super comfortable, but I had all my clothes on and I got through. And then I had another cold night in uh, Oregon. We were at 5,000 feet of elevation and it got down to 40 degrees. So I had two cold nights, but anyway, this, this, all, con this all compresses smaller than my uh, my cold weather bag, which I, I might have just said 30, but I think it's a 17 degree bag. And uh, surprisingly, I might have been better off taking that 17 degree bag. But with this setup here, I got through every night of camping, and uh, this is a fairly cheap bag. I may never use it again. It was nice to have this liner. And my thoughts were if it got real hot at night, I would just put this sleep in this liner only and, and not even get my bag out. So it's nice to kind of have some versatility there and some layers and it got me through. All right, here's the, what I had on the rear. Yeah, it's the 22 Stinger off the Reckless 80 kit. <clears throat> and then this is just your standard camelback of whatever. I kept uh, like a spark plug up in here in this house, but for the most part, this was just for water. Uh, when I hit Moab, I also had a small tarp, backpacking tarp, cinched in below this bag, and then I had the camel back right here and the beaver tail sandwiched this down. I don't know what happened, but after, I guess it was day probably 15 or 16, uh, the tarp slid out. I think it was coming down into Moab, and then we, we rolled through the town of Moab and hit Gemini Bridges Road, which is extremely rough and bumpy and rocky. And I rode eight miles in and pulled over at a overlook and came back to my bike and saw that this thing was gone. And this has all of my clothes plus my rain gear. The camelback was gone and the tarp was gone. And so I backtracked eight miles after, you know, I was freaking out the whole time. Thinking, what am I going to do with just my riding gear now and no extra clothes? And I uh, came upon a guy on a side-by-side -side flagging me down. He saw the bike and he saw my luggage and... Uh, he was freaking out. He had my he had this and the camelback, 
and he was worried to death he wasn't going to find who it belonged to so i was super grateful for that and uh after that you can see this clip right here i started clipping this in to my side bags so that this thing was locked in place and it couldn't go anywhere so that's just something to think about if you modify your reckless 40 with this a bigger top bag it may not hurt to some to fasten it somehow because the this has velcro for the reckless 80 and the stinger eight liter stinger that comes with the reckless 40 it has velcro also but it's much narrower this velcro does not line up with the uh the holster so inside here one of the 20 liter dry bags that comes from Moscow. And so what I carried in here was just a small fleece beanie. That had some extra food in there. I carried an extra pair of, these are uh, climb uh, Gore windstopper gloves. Most days it's gonna be hot, but occasionally you're gonna ride in some cold weather. So I used these two or three times and I was glad I had those. Plus it's good in case your other gloves tear up, you lose one, whatever. Uh, just a pair of synthetic uh, base layer bottoms. It's good to sleep in at night. Kind of keeps your, you know, your sweaty, sticky skin from contaminating your sleeping bag. Uh, just your standard uh, puppy jacket. That's good to have on at night time when you're sitting around camp. Is a pair of uh, zip off the leg zip off you know hiking pants so this is my shorts and my pants if it got cold or hot I was good for both this is a pair of darn tough uh, wool short socks in case it was hot at night I could put these on this is a smart wool t-shirt so I carried one t-shirt to wear on at night I could sleep in this if I needed to and the beauty of all this synthetic or wool clothing is you can wear it multiple nights or days it doesn't get sweaty or nasty or stinky it, you know it, it doesn't smell it's antimicrobial so it, it helps with that so uh if you're motelling it every night and you don't need all this extra stuff it's good you know you can wash your clothes every night in the sink and have a shower but if you're camping like we did most nights it's good to have this stuff that doesn't stink over time uh extra pair of ex-official underwear. What I did is I started out with we're obviously wearing a pair and about every three days I would swap out. And so you can wear this stuff for multiple days and it doesn't get stinky and nasty and grimy and whatever. So I'd wear, I'd put on a pair and I'd find a creek or a sink or somewhere and I'd, I'd wash it and have it drying for the, you know, for the next pair, for the next time I needed it. This is a smart wool kind of a thicker layer. This is a real thin t-shirt, but this is a thicker layer. I think it's a 250 weight smart wool and uh, just a long sleeve t-shirt. So I could have this at night at camp. I could sleep in it if it got cold. I could put it on underneath my riding gear in the morning. And a couple days I'd started out with this, plus the puffy jacket, plus the windbreaker I'll show you later, and my chest protector. Okay, there's an extra oil filter I didn't need. A thicker pair of smart wool socks, a belt I never wore, extra pair of uh, wet wipes that I didn't, I kept these in here so they weren't, you know, cluttering up my tank bag. This is a MSR camp towel. A couple nights we had, you know, creeks, rivers, uh, some springs that we could bathe off in so it's nice to be able to dry off. My toiletry bag, uh, toothpaste, deodorant, soap. Q-tips, you know, just the basic stuff. I keep that in a Ziploc bag that kind of can shrink and conform to whatever. This actually goes in my tank bag. This is a little bitty uh, pump to pump up your mattress. It's kind of a, it's not, it's a, it's a luxury item, I guess. So that's a flex tail gear, a tiny pump. It's kind of nice to have that. Saves you a little bit of time when you're blowing up your mattress. And then a, uh, just a thin balaclava that I never wore. And that is all of my clothes I took for the whole trip. And every once in a while you'll get a motel with laundry or a campground with laundry and you can wash all that stuff.
And in order to wash all this stuff, what I'll do is in my other dry bag here is my rain gear. And that's just a standard, you know, REI brand rain jacket, rain pants. These pants are nice because if I can show you here, the legs, they zip all the way up. So if you're in a hurry and you're trying to put this on so with your boots on and your riding gear, you know, you can stick your boot through like that and then zip it down and you can get it on pretty quick. And I kept all this in an extra dry bag in case it got wet and then it got sunny and hot. I could put this in here and my clothes weren't getting uh, wet from that. So that's all the gear, all the uh, clothes I carried. All right, this is the uh, Moscow Moto temp hole bag and you see I'll have it strapped through here so it can't fall off. That probably saved me when I lost my top bag. But in here, there's my temp stakes. Here's the uh, temp holes. And I learned this trick from a buddy of mine. This is the footprint for my tent. And I take it and I wrap it around the poles and it kind of keeps these things from rattling around, but it also keeps the dirty uh, from your, you know, your tent. It does, I'm not putting it in with my tent and getting it dirty too. If this is wet or muddy or whatever, you kind of keep all that together. And then here in this edition, I think this is, a, they call these a one liter or a two liter pouch. I'm not sure. But what I carry is, carry all dehydrated food and I carry the same food for everything. So this is a uh, mountain house chicken and rice. It's something I like to eat, it sits well on my stomach. So I bought 10 pouches of this and they are two serving pouches. Then if you take Ziploc freezer bags, they have to be the freezer bags because they're thicker and sturdier. Uh, I cut my, I'd cut the, the mountain house bag open and I'd pour half into one and half in another. So this is two servings. And then I wrote down six ounces of water for each one. And at night time, I don't like to eat a big supper. So I would fix one of these and that's one serving. If I was hungry, I could just add all this to one bag and put 12 ounces in here and I'm good to go. And then let's see if I've got some of my oatmeal. I got a few cliff bars in here. Looks like all I have is chicken and rice left over. Okay, so this is homemade oatmeal. Uh, my wife makes these, and it's just a combination of oats and flax seeds and protein powders and uh, dehydrated uh, blueberries and a little bit of brown sugar. And so this is oatmeal to eat, but it's healthier. We know exactly what's going in this. It's not the crack you're buying at the grocery stores. So that's one thing is uh, we would eat it. I'd eat breakfast and I'd eat supper. And then we usually ate lunch out somewhere at a gas station when we were, you know, filling up in town or whatever. And uh, bringing your own food like that saves you a ton of money because you got to think you're out there for three or four weeks and whatever you don't bring, you're buying for. And uh, so I actually got a resupply when my friend met me in Oklahoma. So I carried a bunch of this stuff and uh, that's where the small red pack that I showed, the little pouch I showed you earlier, you put this in the red pouch, put your boiling water in here, fold it up, let this sit for 10 minutes or so, and it's reconstituted, it's ready to go. And uh, I carried extra food in my clothes bag. That was, that was the white grocery bag, but that's all that. So uh, let me show you down here what I have in my tool pouches. Okay, so this is what was in that lower left side uh, tool pouch. This is a uh, works connection, easy drain plug. Uh, so you can lay the bike on its right side and take the drain plug out to do your oil change. And then screw this in, the drain plug, stand the bike back up, pinch that off, take this cap off and drain your oil. And with this bike, this is a 2019 CRF 450L. 
I was doing my oil changes around every thousand to twelve hundred miles and I think I had one that we pushed to about sixteen hundred miles and the oil looked about the same but if you have a bike that requires to do multiple oil changes on the trip something like this is a real handy tool to have uh, what I would do is I uh, would stand the bike back up and then I brought three or four of these these are just one gallon Ziploc bags, and you drain your oil into here, zip it up. Yeah, we typically do this at an auto parts store parking lot. We go in and ask them, tell them, explain the situation. We buy our oil there, buy some towels, do the oil change, dump the oil, the new oil into the bike, and then pour this back into the containers that we that we bought the oil in. And then most of them will take your used motor oil, and so that way you're not having to deal with it and find places to recycle it. Uh, just a small, just a small compact pump. Luckily, I never needed that. A couple of Motion Pro uh, aluminum tire irons with the axle wrench that comes in handy. This is uh, just some paper towels and some nitrile gloves to do an oil change. I got an extra uh, O-ring in there, and I actually brought an extra drain plug because I screwed that up on my last trip, and I thought I'll keep that with me just in case. So in this little pouch here, uh, that's a master link, and there is a second master link. And then here is a section of chain. So before this trip started, I put a brand new chain on. This 450L requires a narrow width 520 O-ring chain that you can't just buy anywhere. And so I thought the chain will be fine the whole trip, but just in case, because I had this, I ordered a second master link and I thought if, if I were to break a chain, have an issue, having this handy is the missing piece of the puzzle to getting me back going again. Now, I still need some kind of grinder to fix this chain, to grind out the links and shorten this down to whatever. But about any farmer you run across out there on this trail or household is going to have a bench grinder, an angle grinder, some kind of grinder that they'll let you borrow to fix this. The grinder is the easy part to find. This narrow whip chain is the hard part, so having two master links allow, would allow me to fix my chain if I needed to. I got new wheel, new wheel bearings in the bike before I left. I carried an extra set just in case. Maybe I screw one up putting it in and I wouldn't know it for 800 miles. So having these bearings again, you got to find somebody that will let you borrow a hammer and a punch, but that's a whole lot easier to find than it is a set of wheel bearings and have them overnighted and then you got to find a place that they'll ship to. So that's pretty small, compact, and that's not that much weight, and that just kind of gave me peace of mind. <clears throat> this is my tool kit here. This is another product from uh, Dirt Bike Gear, a guy out in Gunnison, Colorado. He makes really good quality stuff. So in this tool pouch, come on. And this is just a set of Allen wrenches that are specific to my bike that I might need. And a few little odds and end pieces there. Uh, that's my only screwdriver. It works with the, the T-handle here. So that way I've got a screwdriver. I don't have any uh, flathead bolts on this bike. So I only carried exactly what I needed. Uh, one more Allen wrench. I think that's for Part of my luggage kit i'll explain that here's my socket kit i kept uh, this 10 that's supposed to go on there too the 10 and the 8 but i was using these for doing oil changes and what in the air filter changes so i kept those separate and then that's a 10 millimeter allen for my oil drain plug and i learned on my last trip that that thing gets hot and it gets tight so trying to use this little flimsy thing with an adapter to try to break this 10 mil uh, cap loose didn't work. So I carried a uh, three gauge drive breaker bar, which that's kind of heavy. But when I went to change my oil, I could just cram that down with my foot and it broke the old uh, drain plug loose, no problem. A three eighths an adapter just in case. And then this is my spark plug wrench. And I think that's what the adapter's for. So, this is a spark plug socket. It's got little teeth in there that actually grip the spark plug. 
Uh, I carried an extra spark, spark plug. I didn't need it. You probably never will need it, but if you were to drown your bike somewhere in a river, you gotta be able to take that spark plug out and get the water out of the engine. This is a small ruler. It was a six inch ruler and I cut it down to about two and a half or two and three quarter inches. I rounded the corners off so there's no sharp edges on it. And then I practiced according to the manual how to adjust my chain properly on the trail. And so using the metric side made it real easy to just put this down there on my chain slider and pull my, push my chain down, pick it up, take my chain length. And then that, you know, that's peace of mind right there. Cause you don't want your chain too tight. Let's see, that's a quarter inch uh, combination wrench. And I think that was for uh, one of these tools, something like that. And that's a 10, 13 combo. That's eight millimeter, 12 millimeter. Uh, the famous Nipex pliers that came in handy a few times. An extension and a razor knife. And then I keep these pieces of rubber on these, these are kind of sharp corners so they keep from wearing a hole in my bag. And that's it, that's all of my tools. Okay, here's what was in the uh, the right side lower pouch below the exhaust. And here is a patch kit, a couple bottles of glue, a couple patches, a uh, valve stem, valve core removal tool, some extra zip ties. Oh, and this is the, uh, that's the little roughing tool to rough a tube up. I put it around a business car and taped it up so that way it's not rubbing on anything. And I probably have an extra valve core. Yeah, there's an extra valve core in there in case you damage one of those. Huh, I guess I had extra food in there too. Waterproof matches, uh, electrical tape rolled up. This is just a small little miscellaneous bolt kit off one of those uh, motorcycle specific bolt kits that you can get. So just in case some fasteners, uh, long bolts, short bolts, nuts, uh, water, you know, washer, stuff like that. Just in case. This is a small tube of uh, like JB weld, epoxy weld that you, 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 you know, there's two different types of material and you need them up and it makes like a hard epoxy like JB weld. That's a half a stick of that. And this the miscellaneous wire. Uh, this is a extra brake lever and clutch lever. You know, I run full wrap hand guards. I'm, I'm a big fan of the uh, Sakura Pro Bins, but uh, had a friend a while back, had his bike in a parking lot and kickstand buried, it fell over, it landed just right and broke his clutch lever. And that was with full wrap hand guards. So no more than what that weighs and then, you know, the room that that takes up, I thought might as well carry that. And that saves me from having to hunt down an extra lever, especially the clutch lever, because that's kind of specific to the 450L. So if your bike runs uh, specific parts to it, it, may not hurt to carry some. Uh, I put an extra shift, a longer shifter on this bike, a hammerhead shifter. So I carried a stock shifter uh, just in case. You know, you catch that on a rock and you bend it or break it, it'd be nice to have that. I don't have an extra brake pedal, so I did not carry one. And then these are the brake pads that still have probably 30% life left in them that I took off to put my new pads on for the trip. And I figured I have seen people's uh, brake calipers get hung up before and burn up a set of brake pads in a day without them knowing it. So having a spare set that, that, that could limp you through a few days, I thought might come in handy. That's just a long piece of uh, Tygon fuel hose. Uh, the thought was if I were to run out of gas and I needed to siphon some, there's a siphon tube. And then this is a 18 inch standard thickness uh, rear inner tube. So that way I have a 21 and an 18. Now I know you can put a 21 in the rear and substitute for an 18, but if you're going on this long of a trip, It'd be nice to be able to put a tube in there and just leave it in there and not have to worry about trying to find another tube to replace it with and then swap them back out. Because a 21 will work in an 18, but it won't last in an 18. It will work for a while, but eventually it's gonna 
you know, rub and wear itself out and destroy itself. So that's all of my tool kit for the whole trip. Okay, here's my gear that I wore every day. This is a climb to car jersey. You can see it's vented. Vented on the sides, vented on the sleeves. I rode through a lot of 95 or 90 plus degree temperature, two days of 102, 103 degree temperatures in Utah. And uh, having this vented jersey on made a huge difference. This is a pair of climb to car pants. These things are like 10 years old, but they held up great. They have the big long uh, vents on the thighs. They have pockets right here. There's my knife. Uh, you know, I keep lots of stuff in my pockets, my wallet, chapstick, stuff like that in on one side. I would keep my phone in this other side until I screwed up the zipper. You know, you know, zipping this thing up and down all day, taking pictures, getting my phone in and out. But like I said, these things are like 10 years old or more. So finally just started putting some Kleenex or paper towels and some snack bars in there that would stay in there. And if I fell out, it didn't matter. Uh, I wore a pair of these Troy Lee Designs padded shorts. I can get these things flipped around here. So I wore those underneath my riding pants, give me a little bit of hip protection, some tailbone protection in case I take a tumble. <clears throat> Every day I put on these same darn tough, tall socks. Most days I'd have them folded down because it was so hot. Uh, but again, the the, uh, the wool stuff, you can wear it day after day after day, and it doesn't get nasty. Uh, before the trip, I knew I needed some gloves for, for hot weather. I like the idea of having some leather for riding on the road so much. And I bought something that has the uh, fingertips so you can work a touchscreen phone because if you're traveling using the GPS on the phone, uh, you are constantly zooming in, zooming out, scrolling around, trying to find a reroute, uh, seeing what's upcoming, where's the next gas station. So these worked out great, pretty comfortable. Unfortunately, on the sixth day of wearing these, uh, this seam come in done, stitching came out. So I uh, took some pictures on day six when I noticed this. I'm going to right climb a ladder and see what they say about that. Uh, climb Creos helmet. It's a great helmet, super lightweight, vents good, has the uh, transition lens, which is really nice. You get in the hot sun, uh, you can put that down and it helps, uh, you know, cut down some of the brightness of the sun. I took the padding out a few times and washed it when we had motel days. And then I wear safety glasses uh, with the shield up most of the time. And that way you're getting as much air as possible. Uh, for boots. Before this trip, I had a lot of good people tell me that these uh, Forma Adventure boots are the way to go for comfort. And I gotta say they are. They have a, they're waterproof and super flexible. You know, it's great for dual sporting because on this trip, you're, you're not riding tough terrain. You're just pounding miles all day and you're getting off and you're sightseeing and you're walking around for lunch and stuff like that. So uh, just a standard old style pair of Fox knee pads and these these boots work great no issues there and then for upper body protection i wore a fox uh, raptor chest protector this is an old cell phone case i did carry a garmin inreach mini and i'd keep that right there on my chest so in case i crash and i'm away from the bike i've got my inreach right there it's got good rib protection and then on the back with a couple of volley straps i kept a uh, small insulated windbreaker and uh yeah just a standard something you might see a golfer wear and it's got some lining on the inside and so on cold mornings it was great i could stop the bike peel this thing off lay it in my lap yank this windbreaker off put it on <clears throat> and then strap this back down and then put this back on put my helmet on i was good to go i didn't have to get my luggage to do anything and this is a good place out of the way to keep that and I checked before I left, and my rain gear would fit over all this stuff. So that's what I wore for the entire trip, and everything worked out great. I know a lot of guys like to wear the climb suits. Uh, I've actually got one. And uh, that stuff is extremely heavy, bulky. It is Gore-Tex. It is, has, does have Cordura in case you hit the ground. It's got abrasion resistance in it. It has the D3O armor. 
but uh, if you've worn those jackets, those pants, even with the vents open that you know <clears throat> when it gets really hot outside and you're pounding the miles, that that stuff will absolutely burn you down. So I knew that this was gonna be easy riding and I, wanted, I figured I'd be better off trying to go for more ventilation and cooler gear and not having that heavy stuff on there. So I was glad I went this route. Uh, I do not regret this one bit. And even with this chest protector on, I still got tons of air to my chest with that Dakar jersey. Uh, these boots, I've got some Alpine Star Toucan Gore-Tex Adventure boots. And those things are so freaking hot that there's no way I was gonna wear them for a month straight doing this Trans-America Trail ride. So I was glad I bought these. These worked out great. Uh, I'm actually gonna sell the Toucans now and just keep these things, so. That's my gear. One more quick thing I just found that was in my uh, the tent pole bag on the back of my bike. This is a uh, an emergency bandage, the trauma wound dressing, a six inch uh, hemorrhage control bandage. So this is like a uh, six inch wide bandage that you can wrap around a bad uh, cut. And it also has a plastic piece so that you can crank it down and make a tourniquet out of it. So that's like a worst case scenario type deal. And then this is my jack stand. So what this is, <clears throat> this is the bottom of a, uh, a crutch leg. Like you might get from the hospital if you, you know, come out of the hospital on crutches. This is the bottom piece and you can extend it out if you need be. And so you pick your bike up on the kickstand and prop up the front or the, uh, the back wheel. And then you wedge this underneath the skid plate, the axle, the fork tube or whatever. And it'll hold your bike up and it's a good cheap, uh, quick loop quick solution it works great and most people have crutches laying around from some kind of accident or a family member that does whatever so just something to think about because at some point you're going to need to change a tire change a tube patch a tube do whatever and it's good to be able to get your bike up off the ground if you're by yourself okay let's talk about bike prep real quick uh I wanted to show you how I attach my Moscow Moto Reckless 40 and my Reckless 80 luggage. Uh, I kind of got this idea from uh, around the world Paul. So on the back, you have the back straps here that I usually go through here and then cinch these down, you know, run them back through and that pulls the whole carcass backwards. But if you've ever run this luggage, you know that when you hit bumps, you hit drainage ditches or whatever, this stuff, it, it, it moves around a lot. It flops around side to side, it goes up and down. So you see these two bolts right here? This back harness is actually bolted to my rear rack. And I'll show you how I did that real quick. And I've also got some side racks that I built to help hold this uh, stuff somewhat stationary. I might redesign this because it still does flop some. But basically what I did, if you can see see those two zip ties right there i took a like a metal awl or a punch or a screwdriver and i got it hot with the torch and i burned holes through the harness and then right there so this leg is zip tied to this metal frame and uh on both sides and then with the bolts here this thing does not move at all it, it will these uh, 32 ounce water jugs cause the legs to flop a little bit this way, but it's very minimal. So uh, let me get this thing off here and I'll show you the rest of it. All right, so there's what I made. And uh, you can see this is just some uh, like eighth inch uh, flat bar. I put it in a bench vise and I bit it in kind of a zigzag shape. And that is just a piece of a chain link and I welded it all up and used a small tubing bender. And then you can kind of see what it does. It keeps the bags off of the uh, rear number plates because you can see the rubbage here. That's where it used to rub and, and scratch up. And there's, you know, there's important stuff behind this. And on the other side, you've got the exhaust. And then right here, that's just a piece of angle iron. And it's welded on there and i drilled a couple holes and bolted it on my this is a skaggs rear rack oh and this right here this is a spare clutch cable just in case and uh 
This is a modified uh, Rotopax gas can mount so that I can screw my mount straight to this and it bolts on here. I saw, found a video on YouTube of a guy who made this modification and I kind of copied his uh, idea and it works great. So that's where my luggage, that's where the two screws were bolted in right there. That's what holds everything secure. And then here, here's the other side, same thing, piece of angle iron bolted on. And then this piece has a few compound bends to it, but you can see it goes around and it bolts on the same way. It's just a piece of angle. I can show you right there how it's just a, uh, you know, a little dog leg right there. Then you take this uh, pipe and you smash it in a vise and then you weld it to this. And again, just another piece of chain link right there. And what this is, this is half inch galvanized EMT electrical conduit that you can buy any hardware store and uh, what this does is it helps keep the bags from flopping it helps keep the bags off of your side plates and uh, even though I have these uh, muffler guards this works much better and it also adds some rigidity some triangulation uh, to your subframe and these 450 L's have a great subframe probably the strongest in the game right now but this just adds some more to it and uh, this isn't actually holding any weight. It's just keeping the weight from flopping around. So these, these things have got, uh, let's see, almost 8,000 miles on them now and uh, no issues there. All right, let's talk bike prep. Uh, so before this trip, uh, because I was going halfway to Oklahoma to the Great Plains bunkhouse and meeting a friend uh, he was going to drive his truck out. He brought me a set of tires. So I started off, I'll show you here, with a used, that's a Motaz uh, Rouse 909021 tire. And uh, I got started using some aggressive front braking towards the end of the trip when I was going to meet him because I wanted to see how this tire held up to front braking. And you can see there how it's kind of started to cut. But that tire's got uh, probably 5,000 miles on it. And if I hadn't done the hard front braking, it probably would have lasted for maybe 7,000 miles. And then this is a Tusk uh, D-Sport. Let me see. Uh, Tusk D-Sport Adventure 120-90-18. And uh, this is a cheap tire. I knew I just needed something to get a couple thousand miles to get me to the bunkhouse. And you can see... How much treads left there and on the east coast i hit a ton of rain and so i had to do a bunch of highway riding that i wasn't expecting to but that tire's got at least an easy another 500 to a thousand miles so i would say for dual sport riding that is a good 3,000 mile tire the carcass is hard as a rock it is a pain in the ass to mount i was really hoping i did not have a rear flat tire with that because i didn't want to fight that thing on the trail but if you need a cheap tire it's like Less than 70 bucks, that's a pretty good cheap tire. Uh, I wouldn't want it for trail riding in the mud and uh, slick creek crossings, you know, of the East Coast where it's uh, slimy and snotty. Or you Pacific Northwest guys, I wouldn't use that for that for just general dual sport riding. Uh, that's a pretty good tire. <clears throat> so when I got to the bunkhouse, I had a brand new set of Motaz Rouse tires waiting for me that Steve brought to me. And you can see that tire is pretty well shot, but that's got, let me think here, that's probably 3,500 miles on that tire. And it's it's easily got, I could have pushed that another 500 or 1,000 if I needed to. Uh, it would have sucked off road, but uh, anywhere but wet mud, it, it would have been fine. And these tires are great. They're super soft compound. They're easy to mount. Uh, I've got the front one on there too. It's, we'll check it out real quick. <clears throat> and so I was much more cautious of my front braking, but you can see there how much knob life, and that's about 3,500 miles. So uh, two thumbs up for the Motaz Rails. So the bike got new wheel bearings and spacers and seals front and rear before the trip. It got uh, new brake pads front and rear before the trip. <clears throat> Obviously it got a fresh oil change and a oil, oil filter, air filter with the PC racing filter skins. 
that's what these little dudes are. That's probably three. I think there's three more in there. So what I would do is every couple thousand miles, pop my seat bolts out, check the air filter. I never change the air filter in this bike. Is uh, the air filter has 5,500 miles on it, and I guarantee it looks like I just cleaned it and oiled it right now. So these filter skins, they're super small. You buy them in a three pack and they fold up compact and it's great. You just take your filter off, rip that skin off, put the new filter skin on and you're good to go. And you're riding in a bunch of dust out west, like I said, so it's good. Uh, I, I didn't want to be trying to wash off my greasy, nasty air filter in some motel sink. So with that set up and I went ahead, these are oiled already with foam oil so that's the they come solid white and they're blue because they've been oiled and uh man i use those on my trail bike and everything now so uh new chain and sprockets Let's see if i can show you my front sprocket there uh i think the sunlight's kind of messing that up a view up a little bit it's got okay, i might hit the button there so that's the front sprocket and uh it's got tons of life left in it uh the chain chain feels good the rear sprocket if i can zoom in on that tooth that is a pro circuit or pro taper 45 tooth all aluminum rear sprocket i wanted to try to find one of the better uh aluminum steel hardened you know uh, sprockets but it, in a 45 for a crf you can't find anything but this pro taper and i was worried that uh aluminum sprocket wouldn't last but you can see that thing's got tons of life left in it so that's uh that chain and sprocket setup right there, that's 5,500 miles. And one reason that thing lasted so well, you can kind of see how oily my chain is, is this uh, Cobra chain oiler system. I believe it comes from Moto Minded. I'm not sure. It's the uh, Cobra Nemo 2. If you Google that, you'll, you'll find the link to it. That thing's about a hundred bucks. And what it is, you screw this lid off and then you see this body here and there's a metal cup inside and you fill this thing with like an ounce of 8090 gear oil some kind of thick motor oil or even chainsaw uh, bar oil works good too and what it is you screw this whole body down and when you do that it's got o-rings in here and it creates a suction so when you screw this down it's forcing the oil through this tube that you route down and it's supposed to go right here and drip on your chain before it hits the sprocket. But I was worried about catching that on brush, debris, rocks. So you can see I put a hole right here and that's the tube right there. And I probably, you might be able to see it right there lined up with my chain. And so it drips straight on my chain. And uh, one ounce here if i did this you see the arrow here so in the mornings i would turn that a quarter turn and i'd ease down the road real slow like less than 10 miles an hour and let that drip on my chain and then after lunch i'd give another quarter turn let it drip on the chain for a few minutes if i was doing a long stretch of slab i might hit that another quarter turn each day and that keeps your chain old and you're not having to carry a big can of chain lube and deal with that crap every day. So that goes back to, you know, condensing your, your load out, your weight and everything on the bike. So uh, <clears throat> this thing is a lifesaver. I love that thing. And then my partner that I rode with, he has, if you go on Amazon, you'll find one for like 30 bucks and it works good. But it doesn't, it's, the quality isn't there. This one does not leak in my garage. I can park the bike and let it sit, and it holds the oil like it should. The cheap one on Amazon for like 30 bucks, I think that one's around 100 bucks. But the cheap one for 30 bucks, it doesn't seal off as well. And over time, if you park this bike in your garage, it'll just sit there and slowly drip and make a mess in your floor. So, you know, if you want quality, spend 100 bucks. If you want cheap but functional, spend the 30 bucks and kind of deal with it. Uh, so this is a uh, Nomad five gallon tank. <clears throat> uh, it's about, that gives me about 250 to 300 mile range, depending on terrain. Uh, I think the longest gas stretch we had was maybe 160 miles. So that was plenty good enough. Uh, you know, I got my Ram foam mount there, my plain old 12 volt charger. 
heated grips. You don't need those much, but when you do need heated grips, they're life savers. Uh, my suspension was good before I left. Like I said, I got a front tube right there. I added this little windshield before I left and I did a lot of asphalt. So I think that kind of helped. It kind of just pushes some of the wind over your helmet. So you're, you're not eating all the buffeting, you know, the wind and noise and everything. Uh, of course, good skid plate. Uh, one issue I had with my bike, this FMF Mega Bomb exhaust and it's been on here for about 10,000 miles and you can see the weld job right there that's what it's supposed to look like and this is what you get a good old country boy in arkansas to fix for you when this weld cracks <clears throat> and uh you start panicking on your uh, the biggest ride of your life and you don't know what you're going to do you find a local napa store and ask him who the local welder is and you track that guy down and he just does a quick mid mig weld job and fixes your exhaust uh that was the only problem i had with the whole bike on the whole trip and uh you know you can blame that on fmf not honda everything honda made worked like a champ uh, again you know same bearings and brakes and everything new on the rear uh i checked my valves before i left but these these modern day bikes the, the, the valves don't move in them so you, you don't have to worry about that i will check it now that i'm back uh just for peace of mind but uh, I think that's about it. <clears throat> I carried a couple oil filters. Uh, I did not do an oil filter every oil change. My first oil change wound up being at a Honda shop. So I bought their oil, I bought their filter. I changed it. I carried one in my clothes bag just in case. But I typically would do the oil filter every other oil change. Uh, <clears throat> we usually hit a Napa because all these little small towns across the country have Napa stores. And uh, Valvoline makes a motorcycle-specific oil. Uh, this bike calls for 1030, but that Valvoline's in 1040. I put it in there. I didn't care about it, didn't worry about it. went on. Uh, my buddy's KTM 500. He needed a 2050. And they also make that Valvoline oil in a 2050. And he ran it and actually said he liked it better than the uh, Maxima oil that he's been running. He said the bike was quieter and it shifted better. So he might start running that stuff all the time. And it was like nine bucks a quart. Uh, <clears throat> before I left, I took my whole swing arm off, all the shock linkage, all that got cleaned and re-greased, so I knew that it was good. Uh, I just checked my antifreeze before I left. The bike had 11,000 miles before I left, and uh, everything was good. Uh, I mentioned earlier that you're going to need some way to clean your visor, some kind of cleaner glass cleaner window you know some something to do your your visor and your glasses you're doing that multiple times a day at gas stations <clears throat> uh you're going to deal with a lot more heat than you are anything so be prepared for the heat extra water especially out west uh, let's see here uh, as far as tools go uh don't pack for your fears when it comes to tools and parts uh pack what you buy actually need and use and what you think you could actually i mean be on be realistic about what you could fix if you're broke down in a desert in utah and it's 100 degrees outside <clears throat> uh there's only so many things you can do with these bikes and if you do your maintenance before you leave these things should be good you know three or four thousand five thousand miles is not a big deal for these bikes nowadays they're you know not the old junk that used to break down and foul spark plugs and everything else uh Let's see. <clears throat> oh, one thing I wish I would have took on this trip. I have a, I saw, you saw the bug net that I, little blue bug net bag that I mentioned earlier. I took it and didn't put it on. Uh, that, that seemed like it just annoyed the crap out of me. The bugs were bad, but they weren't that bad. I could usually build a small little fire with some pine cones and some twigs and have a little small six inch fire that would smoke. And that did a pretty good job. But uh, a company called Thermocell makes a small, about an eight inch tall, bug repellent uses a little butane cartridge and some batteries and it heats up and it, it puts off a it's a, it's a, just a bug repellent device i wish i had taken that thing i've actually got it and it never crossed my mind but sitting around camp at night and you're tired and you're hungry and you're trying to eat and fix your food and put your tent up and do all that stuff all the chores at night time uh something like that would have been nice to have just set out there next to me to help keep the bugs away <clears throat> they weren't bad on the east coast i got a few chiggers one night when i camped in a uh, hay field uh, but other than that, the, the West Coast or East Coast wasn't that bad. 
So, but yeah, I mean, the bike ran great. Bucket list ride for sure. Uh, trip of a lifetime. I actually rode from, uh, so the tat starts in Andrews, North Carolina, roughly. You know, there's different variations of it, but for the most part, it's Andrews, North Carolina. But I'm in East Tennessee, so I was pretty close. I was five or six hour drive to Charleston, South Carolina. <clears throat> And I've ridden the uh, South Carolina Adventure route all the way down to Charleston and back. And it starts, it, it, it kind of dead ends at the beach at Edisto Beach. And so I hauled this thing down to Edisto Beach. And so I actually went coast to coast and uh, had to shortcut some of the trail in, uh, on the East Coast around Mississippi and Oklahoma because of rain. And that's just part of it. You know, you, you make the ride what it is and you make your own ride. And, you know, so you do what you want when you want. And it's supposed to be fun. You don't have to cover every square inch of the track uh, to say you did it. So that's what I'm going with. And uh, once we got out west, you know, where the, where the good stuff starts, we hit it all. And uh, we actually did the old track through Nevada. And that was beautiful. Nevada blew me away. When you think of Nevada, I'm typically thinking Vegas and desert and red rocks <clears throat> and uh, to my surprise the majority of nevada is mountains huge mountains with green grassy valleys in between them and it just goes on and on and on and so nevada was a, a nice surprise i was glad we did it it got rough towards the end and so we bailed out and missed the last section but uh for the most part it was great uh, the colorado rockies are beautiful utah is beautiful Oregon is good, but Oregon is like riding through a tunnel of huge trees. Uh, the, the highlight for Oregon for me was actually the roads. Uh, the trail is so fun to ride. It's just fast, flowy, good gravel roads. And uh, that was some of the most enjoyable riding I, I think we did on the whole trip was in Oregon. And then we hit the California coast or the Oregon coast and so I went down to the beach, took our pictures uh the bike blew over in the sand the wind was blowing so hard i tried to bury my rear tire like everybody does and get the picture and the wind hit it and blew it over <clears throat> and that's where it comes in you know you could i could have broke that i could have broke that i had my helmet up here uh, i could have broke my visor got lucky nothing got damaged so i just picked the bike back up but uh then we rode down the 101 coast into california and saw some redwoods and uh that was mind-blowing also the redwoods are so freaking huge man absolutely love that part <clears throat> but uh yeah i just got home i gotta strip this bike down and clean it up good all my gear is filthy and nasty i've got to clean everything it's going to take me a day or more to clean all this junk up but uh trip of a lifetime glad i did it if you're considering doing the tat uh do it uh, you won't regret it it's hard it, it's not hard it's work uh you you get up early you eat you pack you ride all day long, you get to camp, you set up camp, or if you go to a motel, you gotta strip all your stuff off. You know, you're trying to keep your, your, your gear clean, your clothes clean, trying to keep you clean. Uh, and then you're trying to sleep in a bed that's not your bed every night, so you may not, not get the best night's sleep, and then it's back up early again, did it all over again for, you know, it took me uh, 19 days coast to coast. And like I said, I shortcut some of the East Coast, so if I hadn't have done that, I'm looking at 20, 21 days maybe. But it may get time. We averaged about 250 miles a day, every day. Uh, the, the longest day was 370 miles, and the shortest day was 170 miles, and that was to get a motel early to do laundry. And it was over 100 degrees that day, and uh, I think that was Nevada where we were at. So, uh, <clears throat> But yeah, guys, if you've got any questions, uh, leave me a comment. I'll try to help you out tell you anything i know about the trip the bike setup questions gear uh whatever uh i wanted to do this video to help people out for future tat rides and hopefully maybe answer a question for them help them out uh encourage you to go do it uh i think the whole ride i think getting home is the hardest part we had to rent a u-haul truck and drive from california back to oklahoma <clears throat> and that was fourteen hundred dollars just from that distance and then we hopped in my buddy's truck and drove from oklahoma back to tennessee so that was a lot of driving uh, you can ship your bike back there's you know there's several options you can do it's whatever you have the time to do and whatever you can afford to do but uh don't let that stop you just get out there and do it enjoy it and uh hope this helps <clears throat>